I'm James Weaver, and I'm one of the pastors here, and I like to say that because I believe that all pastors pastor, and there, it's, not, it's not department leaders, they have pastors' hearts, and that's what I look for uh, when we, we work together as a team, and Pastor Austin, my son, he preached last week, and it was really, really good, and, and I thought to myself, man, he, he acts more like his Hawkins son than mine, and uh, <laughs> hey, if you were gone last week uh, and you are a veteran or you were active military and you weren't able to be in service, we had them stand up. If you weren't a part of that last week, would you stand? Because I know there's a lot of you gone that are, were in the military. Please, thank you. Stand up, guys and girls, women too, you that were not here last week. I want to recognize all of you. Thank you so much for your service to our nation. God, God bless you guys. God bless you, my friend. Thank you. You may be seated. Thank you guys so much. Uh, I know that uh, uh, it's, um, it is a service to the Lord. And also, did you hear uh, Cheryl Dexheimer? Cheryl, were you here? Where are you at? Uh, you were up here. Stand up, Cheryl. She's right back there. Everybody crank your neck. Stand up back there. Are you standing? Get on top of the pew so we can see you. Uh, <laughs> Cheryl here, they, they, when they got the diagnosis of her cancer, they told Cheryl that uh, not a very good picture, like pretty much just this, you're not going to make it. And then she went to a little bit of treatment for a couple of months or so, and she just got her report, and they can't find any cancer in her anymore. <laughs> so praise the Lord. All right. Mm -hmm. And uh, Pastor Brian, he's around here. I don't know if he's in here or not. Are you in here, Brian? Where is he? In he's in kids' church. He's acting like a kids' church pastor. But I pray for those kids. They're going to be scared of him because, anyway, he had surgery on his head, if you didn't hear. He had melanoma, and his father died of the same exact cancer. And they thought it was a pretty good-sized piece on there. And they thought that when they removed it, that uh, once they did the first uh, sample, they found it, and they thought they were going to have to move a very large piece, and then later, a few weeks later, come back and do a skin graft to cover his head. And... Uh, but when he got in there, something happened miraculously. In fact, the doctor even indicated this, this is, we don't understand. Because all of a sudden, that spot is way smaller. And when they removed it, they could close it up. And they got the pathology back. Zero cancer anymore. He's cancer free. No chemo, no radiation, nothing. No. All he's, all he's got to do is wear a hat and look weird in church because he's got a hat on. So don't be hitting him on the head because he's got a sore spot up there. He looks a little weird anyway, but I sure love him. And a little hat probably helps him out a little bit, actually. I know that I look better with a hat. I look better with a mask, too. <laughs> you know, so it's, I know some of you, when they saw in the bulletin, I saw people leaving when they got the bulletin. Pastor Weaver's preaching. Okay, bye, guys. <laughs> so... Uh, no, not really, but I mean, maybe that happened, but I didn't see it. Uh, but anyway, yeah. Um, next week, Pastor Zach is preaching, so y'all come back. He, he'll, he'll be a good one. You had Pastor Austin, and then after that, we got somebody else good, but today you got me. <laughs> Tonight, I'm doing second part of 1 Corinthians 12. We've been in 1 Corinthians. Take your Bible and open up there. Uh, and I want you to know the title is Holy Spirit Ministry. And uh, let me tell you something. Listen to me carefully. I need, this is for me too, but we all need God. We all need more of God. The problem is there's too much of us, too much flesh. We need to die to ourselves. We need to crucify the flesh or this flesh desires to sinful desires daily. We need less things that though they may not be sinful aren't filling us with God and his spirit. We have so many things that are neutral and natural that we do. We don't have time to do the spiritual. We have to have the Word of God. We have to have time to pray. We have to have time to get to church and gather together and worship. We need each other and we need God. And, uh, the, and, and so there's this everybody principle that my boss taught me years ago, Pastor Wheats, and we, we just, he just hammered that into us that everybody is equally important and everybody has something to do and if everybody did what God gave them to do then we would turn the world upside down 
Because God has something special for all of you to do. And if everybody lived holy, if everybody read the word, if everybody filled themselves with the spirit and prayed and sought God and loved and forgave the way they should forgive and encouraged others and served the Lord and worshiped God in spirit and truth and would witness with the power of the spirit and use the gifts of the spirit and the talents and the abilities that God has given. If everybody did what God asked and listen to you, there would be a change our culture would get changed I mean just one church full of people would do that you'd see a huge change we need God people we need God can you say I need God that that phrase says you're humble the proud resist God they they are proud they are full of themselves they think they can do it and whether you would say I can do it without God your actions sometimes say I can do it without God because you don't go to God enough we need God we need more of God and less of me more of his spirit and less of my flesh we need to be fo fully devoted the songwriter said let my eyes be open that my eyes be open to the way you move. Let my ears be open to the sound of truth. Let, my, let, my, uh, let, let your spirit break out any way you choose. We don't care. We don't care. We just want more of you. We just want you. We want to see more of, of, of God's kingdom, more of heaven, more of God, more of his kingdom come, more of his presence, more of his word, more of his spirit. We want more of heaven here. And how many of you would join me to the close of this service to seek God at this altar and say, God, we, I need, my family needs, I need more of you, Lord. I need more of you and less of me. Raise your hand. Say, I, you, you're going to join me, and we're going to go after God this morning. The first thought that I have from this chapter, as I've broken it down, the message titled Holy Spirit Ministry, is that the Holy Spirit Ministry ministers salvation and sanctification. Pick it up in verse chapter 12 of 1 Corinthians, verse 1. Now about spiritual gifts. Notice he turns and changes subjects. It's a hard about face. He totally leaves chapter 11 and starts a new subject about spiritual gifts. Notice he's talking about spiritual gifts because the next two verses have been taught wrong, preached wrong. I've never preached it right, and most of you have never heard it preached right but it is in the context of spiritual gifts in the Corinthian church. And these people were messy. These people were immature. These people were fleshy. These people needed Paul's teaching so that the power of God flowing through them would bring about a good result and not destructive result. So he starts off about spiritual gifts. Brothers, I don't want you to be ignorant. Now, ignorant doesn't mean stupid, okay? I got a little stupid in me. Uh, you know, I don't know about you, but I do. But ignorant means you just don't know, you know. And, and so you, that's okay. They didn't know. Some of you don't know about the spiritual gifts. You know that when you were pagan somehow or, or other, you were influenced and led astray to mute idols. They were pagans, and they started worshiping things that were made by the hands of man. They were, went to idols. And uh, therefore... And he says, so, so now I'm going to tell you something. I tell you that no one who is speaking by the Spirit of God says, Jesus, be cursed. And no one can say, Jesus is Lord, except by the Holy Spirit. Jump into verse 12 of the chapter. The body is a unit, though it is made up of many parts. And though all of its parts are many, they form one body. So it is with Christ. We're one. Look at this, for we were all baptized by one spirit into one body. Whether Jews or Greeks, slave or free, we were all given the one spirit to drink. In John 4, Jesus says, I have water to drink that you will thirst no more. That's the water of the spiritual birth of Jesus Christ, the miraculous change in the heart. Grace is not a definition word that we apply to give us an assurance, a false assurance that allows us into heaven. Grace is the work of the Spirit that comes and changes your heart and saves you by giving you a new desire, a new, new way of looking at life, to think the way God thinks, to feel about things the way God feels about them, to see life through God's eyes because he's changed your heart. And I, I've said it many times, but I feel compelled to say it again. The heart isn't just emotion. 
It is thinking. Proverb writer says, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. It's not the physical thing that pumps blood, okay? So it's our thinking, it's our emotion, it's all of our being. God changes us from the inside out, and that's the work of the Spirit of God. Look at it, it says, we are all baptized by one Spirit, verse 13, into one body. Put that verse back up there, 13. We're all baptized by one Spirit into one body. That's salvation. The Spirit baptism is salvation. You see that? Spirit baptism is salvation. I had someone used to tell me, well, we don't need Spirit baptism because we got it when we were saved. That's not what that says. It says that we're saved by the Spirit. We're born again of the Spirit. Over in John chapter 3, where it says God so loved the world, before that, when he's talking to, to Nicodemus, Jesus says, you got to be born again. And he says, well, how can I go back in my mother and be born again? He's talking, well, that's a, that's a physical birth. You don't, you don't do that. I'm talking about a spiritual birth. What do you mean a spiritual birth? Yeah, born again of the Spirit of God. God's Spirit invades your heart, changes it. That's spiritual birth. That's the Holy Spirit ministry to convince your heart, to change your heart, to make you not try to be religious and go, I got to follow all these things so I can somehow get up the highway to heaven and make it to heaven and be Mr. Good Boy so that God will let me in. No, if you're struggling in your own self, that's just religion. You got to have Jesus come and invade your heart and change your heart and save you, and change you and give you a desire, give you a new desire. That's the work of the Spirit. Only He can save you. We're baptized. Now, what about the baptism we call the baptism of the Spirit? That's actually the baptism of Jesus. What did John the Baptist say? He said, There comes one after me that I'm not even worthy to tie his shoes. His name is Jesus. And he says, He, when He comes, He will baptize you with fire and the Holy Spirit. That's Jesus. That's when Jesus has gone to heaven. What did Jesus say? He said, I'm going to go away. And he said, it's good that I'm going to go. He's going to leave this earth physically. He said, it's going to be good, he told his disciples. Because when I go, I'm going to send my spirit. And my spirit will come and abide in you. And it will fill you and will lead you and guide you, teach you into all truth and empower you to be my witnesses. That's what the spirit does to come to live within us. And Jesus is the one that puts his spirit in us. The spirit pushes you puts Jesus in, the Spirit changes our heart, and then Jesus comes, and then by His power, He puts the Holy Spirit of truth and light and power within our being. Woo! That is good stuff right there. And the third baptism is water baptism. Water. Water, water, water. That's John's baptism. That's when you lay down your life. That's just a, it, it's, it's, it's a powerful event. But it's when Romans 6, it talks about it, that we're buried with Him in baptism. But we're resurrected to new life. The old man has passed away. Behold, the, the, everything, all things are new. So Christ, that's the, there's those three baptisms in the scripture. And part of the work of the Holy Spirit ministry is salvation and sanctification. Notice in chapter 12, the first part of it. That somehow, that they were influenced and led astray to mute idols. I mean, people that might believe in God. But let me tell you something. There is a work. Sanctification is the process of becoming like God. Becoming holy. The Bible says, be holy even as I am holy. The Bible says, without holiness, no man will see God. And what, we, what the modern religion says, is holiness doesn't matter. Modern religion says, everybody's going to heaven because God's grace has saved you, died on the cross for you. It doesn't matter how you live. Well, hello, James, the half-brother of Jesus, dealt with that. He says, you show me your faith. You, can, you, you tell me about your faith, but I'm going to show you my faith by my works. And he says, faith without works or result is dead. The demons believe in Jesus. They have faith. That's worthless. That's not enough. It's when you believe and then you trust by surrendering and calling on him and bowing your knee and making Jesus Lord. Making Jesus Lord. In the church at Corinth, amazing things were happening. The Holy Spirit was moving. There was ecstasy. There was enthusiasm. And there was at times hysterical excitement and self-delusion. And that sometimes today, in the midst of, quote-unquote, the moving of the Spirit, people do goofy stuff that's not of God at all. How many of you ever seen it? So the rest of you hadn't, maybe you've been here long enough. <laughs> Let me tell you what was going on. They were getting up, and under the supposedly the Spirit of God, they were cursing Jesus. It was, it, was, it was what was going on under the gifts of the Spirit. They were confused, and they would get up, and, and the church, they'd be cursing Jesus. And this is not an uncommon thing for that time, because listen, you, this is what you've never heard. There's, the, there's two phrases 
that, that, that we're going to look at. One of them is Jesus is Lord. It's the creed of the believers, early believers, and should be ours. And the second one is, accursed be Jesus. And it wasn't for the Christians that did that. And there's four ways this terrible phrase, accursed to be Jesus, could be used. The first would be used by the Jews. The synagogue prayers, in the synagogue, their prayers included regularly a cursing for all apostates. Po apostasy is false. False Christ, false teaching. And they would curse all apostates, and Jesus would come under that. Further, Paul knew, and he even said this in Galatians 3, 13, that the Jewish law laid it down, quote, cursed be everyone who hangs on a tree. Jesus was crucified on a tree. He hung on a tree. And so they, would, they were confused and people would be cursing Jesus. It would be no uncommon thing to hear the Jews pronouncing their cursings on this heretic, this false prophet, this false teacher, uh, this false Messiah. They would be cursing him as, as, uh, and, and, uh, as, uh, as a criminal who the Christians worshipped. It's by no means unlikely that Jews would have made proselytes attracted that, that some of the, 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 the Christians, the people that became followed under Christianity when they would start that, that the Jews would, would tell them, you need to denounce Christ, you need to curse Christ. Someday it might come to us, right? You either you denounce Christ. It's happening right now in some of, some of our nations. The Christians are being martyred because they won't den deny their faith. And so it's not that unlikely that uh, the Jews would make a proselyte or a, a, a Christian that was a Jew curse Jesus. So it's by no means unlikely that the Jews would, would uh, also make them denounce Jesus Christ. And they would be suffering excommunication from the synagogue if they didn't. They'd be kicked out. When Paul was telling Agrippa uh, about the time when he was Saul and he was, he was persecuting the church, in Acts chapter 26, verse 11, he said this. Paul said, I often punish them, talking about the believers in Christ, I would often punish them in every synagogue, and I forced them to blaspheme. This is Saul before he became, had the conversion experience, now the apostle Paul. He made them blaspheme. What's he saying? He made them curse Jesus. He persecuted them. It must have been a, 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 a often a condition of remaining within the synagogue that a man should pronounce a curse on Jesus Christ. And whatever was true when Paul was writing, it is certainly true that later on, in the greater days of persecution, the Christians were compelled either to curse Christ or to die. In the time of Trajan, it was a test of plenty, the governor of Bithynia, to demand that a person accused of being a Christian should curse Christ. When Polycarp, the bishop of Smyrna, was arrested the demand of the proconsul Statius Quadratus, here's what that he, they said he should do. Say away with the atheists, swear by the Godhead of Caesar, and blaspheme Christ. And this great bishop, Polycarp, his answer was, I quote, 80 and six years have I served Christ, and he has never done me wrong. How can I blaspheme my king who saved me. There certainly came a time when a man was confronted with the choice of either cursing Christ or dying, and it could come about again. There was that possibility even in the church, as I mentioned, that some semi-mad frenzy might cry out a curse to be Jesus in the hysterical uh, frenzy of emotion and selfishness and confusion and ignorance. Ignorance. I don't want you to be ignorant you never would be cursing Jesus. That's not right. The Spirit of God doesn't do that. He's correcting it. See how crazy Spirit-filled people could be, although maybe the ones doing that weren't? I don't know, but I know he's correcting it in the church. Secondly, the second battle cry, the, uh, the, the, the battle cry of the Christian, rather, is Jesus is Lord. If the early church had a creed, it was just Jesus is Lord. Philippians 2.11, let every knee bow, every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. For God has given him to us, right? And we should bow before him. And he gave his life for us. The word for Lord there 
was a tremendous word. It was the official title of the Roman emperor. Remember, the demand of the, the persecutors always was, say, Caesar is Lord. Remember when they were crucifying Jesus? We have no king but Caesar. We have no king but Caesar. G C Caesar was their Lord. And it was a word by which the sacred name Jehovah was rendered in the Greek translation of the Old Testament scriptures, this word calling Jehovah Lord. And when a man could say Jesus is Lord, it meant that he gave his Jesus the supreme loyalty of his life, supreme worship of his heart. He was fully devoted. devoted. Lord means ruler, master, king. I ask you a question. Are you saved? If you were to die today, would you end up in heaven? Would you wake up in heaven? Do you know for sure that you have Christ in your life? Is Jesus your Lord? Are you staying clear of idols, sin? Are you sanctified? Are you living holy? Is your speech pure, your heart pure, your motives pure, your passion pure? Are you close to God? Will you bow your head with me? In Jesus' name I pray right now. Please close your eyes. Respect your neighbor. If you want Jesus to forgive your sin and you want to be a child of God, and you want the assurance of eternal life, if you want the peace to know that if you were to lie down tonight and not wake up, that you would end up in heaven. We call on Jesus. He's the one that will save you. Forgive my sin. Wash me. Cleanse me. I confess you, Jesus, as the Lord of my life. From this day forward, I will quit following my selfish desires in my life the way I want it, and I will surrender as you taught us to pray. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. I will live for you, God. I will serve you. And I, will, I trust you to forgive my sins and wash me clean so there's nothing between me and you, God. And give me that peace that I know, Lord, that you've forgiven me and you'll accept me into your heaven forever and ever. Thank you for the gift of eternal life through your son, Jesus, Father God. I trust in you right now. And thank you for it. Amen. In just a moment, when many people in the church come forward to seek after God, to say, I need God. I need more of Jesus. I want to see God clear. I want to be more full of God. I'm going to ask those of you that might have prayed that to come here and stand and say, Lord, I'm, I'm telling you, I'm going to follow you. You're going to come and you're going to stand and say, Jesus, you're going to be my Lord from this day forward. Not only is the Holy Spirit work one of sanct salvation and sanctification, but it's, we see in this passage differing gifts, but it's the same Spirit picking up in chapter 12, verse 4. There are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit. Different kinds of service, but the same Lord. Different kinds of working, but the same God, which works all of them and all men. Now to each man, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for common good. Notice it's about the body, not the individual. To one, there's given through the Spirit the message of wisdom. To another, the message of knowledge by means of the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healing by the one same Spirit. To another, miraculous powers. To another, prophecy. To another, distinguishing between spirits. To another, speaking in different kinds of tongues. And let me pause there and say, this is not talking about private praying. This is talking about public use of tongues. The word that needs to be, according to the scripture, interpreted. In other words, when you've gathered in a Bible study or small group or in a setting like this, if there's a spiritual language given, it needs to be interpreted. And that's what this list is. These are public body ministries, not private prayer languages. So it says to another, speaking in different kinds of tongues, and still to another, interpretation of tongues. All these are the work of one and the same Spirit, and He gives them to each one just as He determines. In other words, you don't own the gift. The gifts are of the Spirit. He uses you in them. He gives them as needed to you. It'd be like God owns all the tools, and when he needs that tool used, he gives it to you, you use it, but it belongs to him. You don't own it. Is anybody here that has a gift of healing, and they know that they can heal anybody here, come stand, and we're going to stop right now, and you're going to heal everybody. But if you don't, I'm going to stone you. <laughs> don't tell me you got the gift of healing, that you possess it, and you can heal anybody, because you can't. Not unless the Holy Spirit's flowing through you for the moment as he wills, then the gift of healing flows and you're healed. Y'all with me? All right? Now, when it talks about prophecy, let me tell you what I believe. I believe that the Holy Spirit's in us all here. In the Old Testament, the prophets were people close to God that would hear God, that God would choose to speak to the people. But now we have the Holy Spirit that speaks to us. And he can reside in all who call on the name of Jesus. And he teaches us. 
Right? He speaks to us. And we have the word of God that was given to us. And between the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, the word and the spirit, we have all we need. And when we says prophecy there, a better word would be preaching. It would be anointed, quickening truth that speaks to man. In the Old Testament, prophecy was foretelling, future telling. In the New Testament, prophecy is truth telling, anointed, preaching. Okay? So, for instance, here's, here's, here's an abuse of it. Here's an abuse of prophecy is I'm going to prophesy over an individual a particular thing, and I'm going to tell them you need to go to Africa and be a missionary. And I've had this happen. I've had to talk them off the ledge because the person had zero ability to be a missionary or to speak or do anything, and they were frustrated because all their life they believed this guy that told them that. Now, do I believe that God can give you a word of knowledge and you can speak over someone that God's already spoken to them and they know and you're encouraging them because you heard God for something to say to someone? Yes, absolutely. That's a different thing. That's not what I'm talking about. That's, that's word of knowledge. That's knowing something the Spirit gives you. You give it to that person about somebody, you might tell them. Or God might give you a knowledge about someone and you lovingly you protect and confront. He won't tell you something about someone that's negative if you're going to spread it around and hurt a person with it. He'll only give it to you if you're mature enough to use it and help a person, never to hurt a person. Are you with me? So I'm not going into these gifts. I'm not going into it, but I am telling you we're all different, but it's the same spirit, and you're different, but you have something that you're given to do. Paul's idea in this, in this section is to stress essential unity of the church, that the church is the body of Christ, and the characteristics of a healthy body is that every part performs its function to the good of the whole. But unity does not mean uniformity. Unity does not mean uniformity. We're not all the same. We can be together, just like all parts of the body are different. And so, uh, it, there, it, therefore, within the church, there are differing gifts and differing functions. Every one of them is a gift of the same spirit and design given to you specifically. And it's not for the glory of the individual member of the church, but for the good of the whole. Remember how Paul started the letter? Some of you say, I'm of Cephas. Some of you say, I'm of uh, Apollos. Some of you say, I'm of Paul. You're arguing about who you are. You think you're something. And what did he say? That no, nothing boasts except the boasting in the cross of Jesus and that Christ be glorified. It's not about you, folks. It's the Holy Spirit that gives you anything you can do good. It's to the glory of God. You're not better. I'm not better. You know, people say to me, why do you let these other pastors preach? I've never seen a senior pastor do that. Why would you do that? Well, I'll tell you why. Because they need to develop, and because I'm getting old, and because I'm getting tired of preaching, and because I don't like my own preaching. That's why. And besides that, now most of them are better than me. Every, everybody except. Uh... I don't even know. <laughs> all right, I'm just kidding. All right? Besides that, they all do great, and they've grown. Man, thank God they're all different, you know? It's not about me. It's about God. It's about His giftings in us. And so, you know, one of the mistakes we make with these gift, special gifts, this charismata, the, the word we talk about gifts, is where we get the word charismatic, that we believe in the gifts, that we believe in the Holy Spirit working through us uniquely and powerfully. And if those gifts are from God, then they are to be used for God. And we limit them so many times to narrowly to teaching and praying and writing and intellectual gifts. And it would be great if we could understand that the gifts of men are gifts also that people can work with their hands. Just as special gifts from God as the teacher or the preacher, the mason, the carpenter, the electrician, the painter, the engineer, the chef, the gardener, the mechanic, the engineer, the plumber, all have special gifts which are from God and can be used of God. The artist, etc. The music, all of these things. Let me tell you something. People have come here and found Christ because our yard looks so beautiful and our flowers are amazing. Figure that out. Who does it? Volunteers. If you've got gifts that way, you need to step up right? Step up. You got a gift, use it. If you got a beautiful yard, this yard comes before your yard. How you like that? You like to clean, you like to clean, and you keep a pure, clean house, and your house is always in order? Guess what? This building needs you to clean. We got four places open because people are moving away, and some people have some surgery, and they can't clean anymore. You need to clean because that's a gift for you. Are you hearing me? By the way, you can't hire anybody to clean as well as the people who clean our church because they clean it from the heart and they volunteer. It takes about an hour a week. They show up about 2 o'clock in the morning anytime throughout the day. They're in here cleaning. You walk in, it's dark, and they may be cleaning and praying because when you clean, you got to pray that you can be clean. You pray for the church and clean. you got to do, do a thing because it doesn't take a lot of brains to clean, right? You just clean. But there are people gifted with cleaning, and I'm not it. I did for two years, though, clean the toilets. Austin was with me. Remember that, Austin? Wasn't that wonderful? 
So if you need to clean, stand up, Julie. Do the hello wave. See Julie after service. You know what Reagan said? President Reagan, remember him? There's no limit to the amount of good you can do if you don't care who gets the credit. No amount. How's it go? There's no limit to the amount of good you can do if you don't care who gets the credit. I love that quote. I think he had some good speech writers. I don't think he thought of that. But anyway. But can you imagine all believers living with Jesus as Lord, full of the Spirit, using God's gifts, talents, and energy for God's glory and ministry to each other and also to the world, this lost, blind, dying world, where this world that wrong is called right and truth is too often ridiculed as hate speech? Paul was pastoring and teaching these young Christians at this Corinthian church how the Spirit moves and how to keep all things orderly, and he's confronting pride and selfishness and that was still prevalent even though in this Holy Spirit church. And folks, we need God, and you need more God, and I need more God, and we need more of the Spirit. The picture we get of this church is it's vividly alive. Things are happening. Miracles are happening. Holy Spirit is using people in gifts and talents and energy for God's glory and ministry to each other and to the lost, blind, dying world. Listen, I said this in the early service. I feel led to say it again. Paul also deals with another topic that's kind of sensitive and difficult. See, in the Corinthian church, these Greeks, they believed that they were, they were a sexist. They oppressed women. Jesus undoes that. He says in the, in, the, in the kingdom of God, Jesus said, Paul has actually said it, but he learned it from Jesus. He said that there's no male or female. But guess what? The Greeks didn't get it. Well, the women were out of order. They were acting terrible. And in this tradition, they would, the women on one side, the men on the other side, and then a woman would have a question, and they would yell across at their husband over here about it and say, what? What does he mean by that? I don't think that's right. And there was chaos and confusion. So Paul says, let, don't, let your women be silent in church. And so some people teach that women can't say anything in church. Women can't teach. Women can't do this. Women can't do that. Baloney, baloney, baloney. Deborah was a prophetess. When Paul established his first churches, he put women over them as pastors. God's Spirit moves through all of you, children, teens, women, men, all of you. Berean Assembly on the east side where I was there for nine years, that was started by a woman. Women, God will use you. We're not sexist here, do you hear me? Or racist. I hate racism. Did I ever say that before? Third thing, not only different gifts with the same Spirit, you're all different, but God's Spirit has something special for you. It's the same importance, but different people. It's all important, guys. You're just as important as the next. And the enemy will make you think you, you have nothing. And look at these last verses, and I'm almost done. This is the shortest point. You'll be glad of that. Verse 12 of chapter 12. Now the body is not made up, the body is not made up of one part, but of many. If the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I don't belong to the body, it would not for that reason cease to be part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I don't belong to the body. It would not, for that reason, cease to be part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But in fact, God has arranged the parts of the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. If they were all one part, where would the body be? As, if it, as it is, there are many parts but one body. The eye can't say to the hand, I don't need you. And the head can't say to the feet, I don't need you. On the contrary... Those parts of the body that seem to be weaker or indispensable. You ever had your big toe get stumped? Ooh, ooh, bad. And the parts that we think are less honorable, we treat with special honor. And the parts that are unpresentable are treated with special modesty, while our presentable, presentable parts need no special treatment. That first beginning of verse 24, I don't know if I agree with that. Our presentable parts need those special treatment. I think that my face could use some special treatment. Uh, I'm not real sure about that. Uh, it, uh, you think you might agree? That's a joke. But God, that's not what it's saying. But God has combined the members of the body and has given greater honor to the parts that lacked it so that there should be no division in the body but that, in, it, it's, it's, but that its parts should have equal concern for each other if one part suffer, every part suffers with it. And uh, if one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. 
Now you're the body of Christ and each one of you is a part of it and an important part and God has a pers person and a plan for you in your life. So here, here's the deal. <clears throat> do what God's given you to do because God's given it to you. God's made you special. You may not think it's as significant, but it's really significant. If you watch babies, you know how important that is to me. My two-year-old granddaughter's in there and she's my daughter on steroids. She needs special patience in the two-year-old class. So if you're a preschool lover of kids, it's work. Listen, Bible says the workers are few. The ministry is work. I didn't say it wasn't work. But God's spirit gives you abilities that give you desire. Listen, we, we just sometimes are lazy. We just want the grace of God and sit on our big fat spiritual rears and just kind of bounce into heaven. That ain't, that's not okay. We need to be workers. And if you're not using something and serving somewhere, you need to get with it. You need to connect. You need to serve. You need to be a part. You need to give of yourself. How many of you with me? How many of you wish I'd shut up by now? I'm about done. There's one person that's a little nutty. They don't think I should. Plato pointed out that we don't say my finger has a pain. We say I have a pain. And the I the letter, the capital letter I, the, it, the person is Jesus, and we are his body. And if somebody needs love, they need our love. If somebody needs to be taught, they need a voice. If a child needs to be taught, they need a teacher to teach them. If you're sick, you need a doctor or a surgeon or someone with the gift of healing to pray for you. If you need a story told, he has to find a man to tell it. Literally, we have to be the body of Christ, the hands of Christ, the feet to run his errands, a voice to speak for him. Someone once said, he has no hands but our hands to do his work today. He has no feet but our feet to lead men in his way. He has no voice but our voice to tell men how he died. He has no help but our help to lead them to his side. So the supreme glory of a believer is the fact that we get to be the part of Christ's body and be Christ on earth by his power of his spirit in us to others. We are the only Jesus they will read. The Bible says we are a letter written from God a letter to the world to speak of Christ and his love. That's why our behavior, our words, our actions matter. They matter. Someone said, as an old farmer that got a beat up old farm and got it for a good price because it was over, weeds were everywhere, it was a mess. A few years later, it was the most beautiful farm in the area. He'd worked so hard. One of the farmer boys came by, all spiritual, said, boy, oh boy, look what God has done. Look at this farmer. You look at those fields. Look at that house. Boy, God has really done a, an amazing job on your farm. And that old farmer said, yeah, you should have seen God when he had it by himself. It wasn't very good. <laughs> Let me tell you, the church isn't very good unless he's got us, right? We, he needs us. So these are the final things as the musicians come. We got to realize, number one, in this passage, that we need each other. You're important, your gift. I need your gift. You have a gift. I need it. Everybody needs it. The world needs it. We need each other. No isolation in the church. We, so, we, can, we can become so engrossed in the bit of work that we're doing. We're convinced sometimes that our work's the only one that matters. Every work matters. How many of you like coffee in the coffee shop? You know, some people that work their little knuckles to the bone to make that available for you. We ought to, and that, and that builds cornea, cornea fellowship around that coffee. We ought, it's also the heavenly energy. We also <laughs> need to respect each other that we're different. Respect each other. The, 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 there, the, there's no question of the relative importance. Any limb, any organ ceases to function. The whole body is thrown out of gear. We need every person. We also need to sympathize with each other. If any part of the body is affected, the other suffers. Just like we rejoice with the healings, we also cry with the loss of a loved one, and we continue to do so. So we got to grasp the real unity of the church. And finally, get everybody, this is humility. Pride resists God. Humble says, I need God. We need the Holy Spirit to minister in such a way that helps the body, but also helps the world. We must be people full of the Spirit, people of the Spirit. Let my eyes be open to the way you move. Let my ears be open to the sound of truth. Let your spirit break out any way you choose. We don't care. We don't care, Lord. We just want you. 
And when the Holy Spirit moves and God's Spirit begins to do, however we act here, you can jump really high. You can get really excited. Just like at camp happens, you know, you get all excited. But when you come home and you go to school, if you don't walk straight, your camp experience is worth nothing. Jump as high as you want. Shout as loud as you want. If you don't walk the way, the path of Jesus, and live out the truth, then nothing's going to happen. That's why you got to have all the disciplines of the Word of God to be taught, to read the Word, to pray, to be a part of the church. Will you stand with me? And if you want more of God, as we begin to sing it, run to this altar. And if you've given your heart to Jesus, come and declare Jesus as your Lord. As we sing it.